Today's video is going to be emotional and I might even break down and cry. Everything inside of me just wanted to scream. Thank you. As I paint this tribute piece, I'll be sharing stories about my grandparents who lived through World War II and my own deep connection to Remembrance Day. This painting is for those who served, those who fell, and those who remember. Let's get into it. What is Remembrance Day? Well, Remembrance Day is recognized on November 11th each year in many countries, not just here in Canada, um, but especially those countries that were a part of the Commonwealth. Well, what is that? It is a voluntary association of about 56 independent countries that were formerly part of the British Empire. Well, they're no longer under British rule, but these countries maintain a shared historical connection. Some of these countries are Canada, Australia, India, South Africa, the United Kingdom, just to name a few. Now, the date itself marks the anniversary of the armistice that ended World War I in 1918. This happened on the 11th hour of the 11th day of the 11th month. Remembrance Day is a day to honor and remember military personnel who have served and or died in wars, conflicts, and peacekeeping missions. It is a time for Canadians to reflect on the sacrifices made by those who served and their families. So what can you expect to see on Remembrance Day here in Canada? Well, people will be wearing poppies, and I'll go into that a bit more in the next section of this video. Um, there will be ceremonies, uh, parades, usually at or close to war memorials and cenotaphs across the country. Wreaths are laid at those memorials in tribute to those who have served, and often we'll be hearing the playing of the last post to honor the fallen soldiers. So overall, Remembrance Day is a time for Canadians to come together and express their gratitude for the service and sacrifice of their armed forces. Now, what's with the poppies? Well, the red poppy has become a very powerful symbol of Remembrance Day, and it represents the memory of those who have lost their lives in war. The association between Poppy and Remembrance Day originated from World War I, specifically through the famous poem In Flanders Fields by Lieutenant Colonel John McRae, a Canadian physician and soldier. Now, in the poem, McRae describes the bright red poppies that grew over the graves of soldiers in the battlefields of Flanders, which is a region in Belgium. These poppies became a symbol of both the sacrifice of soldiers and the hope for a peaceful future. Now today, wearing a red poppy is a way to show respect for fallen soldiers. Most people wear them starting from late October all the way till November 11th. And it serves as a visual reminder of the sacrifices made during conflicts and the importance of remembering those who have served. Well, I decided to make a painting that shows the poppies as it is such a strong symbol of Remembrance Day, and I will also incorporate soldiers' graves in this painting as well. If you haven't seen my video about how I gathered reference photos and made the composition of this painting, I'll link it in the description so you can check that out if that is of interest for you. By the end of this video, I will read the poem in Flanders Fields after the painting reveal, which I'll probably won't be able to do without crying, so just a heads up. Now, before I go into some very interesting stories about what my grandparents went through and situations they found themselves in, I have to let you in on a few facts. Now, for those who have followed me for a while, you know my background and where I'm from. But if you're new here, I was born and raised in the Netherlands. Now, why is this so important? Because World War II was such a big part of the Dutch history and it's been passed down and ingrained into education. So you're told about World War II and everyone knows who Anne Frank is. I remember actually reading part of her um, diary. They, you will be able to pick up that book in almost any public library in the Netherlands. Well, my grandparents were very much alive um, when I was younger, obviously. So I've heard these stories from the war firsthand and I wanna tell those that I can remember and I hope that I tell them with as much accuracy as possible because I believe these stories need to be told. So we will never ever 
forget. I'm gonna start with my grandmother on my mom's side of the family. And she was a teenager during the war. Actually, all my grandparents were in their teens or maybe early 20s, but they were very young. And my grandmother and my grandfather, they were dating each other actually at, uh, during the war. Now, my grandmother also lived very close to Rotterdam. For those that are, you know, a little bit more uh, invested into like the history of World War II and especially the Dutch history, you're probably gonna go like, oh no. Because Rotterdam was one of the cities that was heavily bombed. So if you look at Rotterdam today, especially like the core, like the heart of the city, it doesn't have many historical buildings because it all got leveled by bombs during World War II. So my grandmother lived like, not like in the city per se, but like very close to it. So she was really close to the main fire, right, of the bombings. Now she was dating my grandfather at the time. I think she was around 15, he was around 18. Well, obviously the war was about five years, right? So. Yeah, they were teenagers during that time. So my grandmother had a bunch of sisters and um, she would tell me the story about like the air fights, the air raids and you know, the German planes versus the British planes. Now they called the British planes Tommies in Dutch. So Tommies, right? And she remembered like the, hearing them. She remembered hearing the, the, like the bombing, the fighting and everything that was going on in the air. And she would run to like one of the windows in the house and her sisters as well. And they would be looking outside and, and every time a German plane would go down, they'd be cheering and they'd be hollering and, and, and they would just, you know, egging on the, the British fighters so that the German planes would be, you know, shot out of the sky. Well, that was much to the dismay of her mother who'd be yelling at her daughter saying, get away from the window, because obviously it's not safe to sit there watching these airplanes go over your head and watching bombs being dropped around you, right? So yeah, but I do remember my grandmother telling these stories and she would like smile at it and laugh because obviously didn't quite fully understand the danger that they were in. So her mom would get her and her sisters out of the window sills and away from the fighting, even though it was very exciting for, for her to see the German planes go down. And to give you a little bit of a backstory, like the Netherlands, um, they were oppressed by the Germans, like the Germans took over the country uh, real quick. So they weren't part of fighting the Germans. Like the, the Netherlands is not a big, big country compared to Germany. It's pretty small. I mean, they would not have stood a chance really against the massive, massive army that, that Germany ha was coming with. So another one of her stories that I remember very vividly is that she was outside walking with her boyfriend, my grandfather. And now my grandmother has some Jewish in her like generational line, but she is not like 100% full on Jew. How she explained it to me was that it, she was like Jewish, but to the like the ninth degree. So I would assume that like generations back in her bloodline, in her family, uh, people were like full on 100% Jewish. And then I guess you marry somebody else who's not a Jew and then you have kids and then, you know, you're like, first second degree or whatever and like anyway so she was way down the line so there is some jewish blood on that side of the family but i don't think she was considered a jew we, she was not she was not forced to wear like the star on her clothes that many other dutch jews jewish people would have to wear so but she did have like kind of a jewish resemblance you know like they had a certain look about them or like certain hair color certain like eye colors or whatever it, it was and um, even though, you know, the Germans had taken over the Netherlands, people were still allowed to go outside in the streets and, you know, do things and what have you. So she was out and about with my grandfather and they were approached by a German soldier. And the German soldier asked my grandfather, she didn't speak to my grandmother, asked my grandfather, is she a Jew? And my grandfather answered, and I'm going to say it in Dutch first and then I'm going to translate it. My grandfather answered, Now, zijn dat dan geen mensen? In other words, aren't those human beings as well? And continued walking. And they were extremely lucky that that was all that happened. 
because that could have ended so badly. But kudos to my grandfather, you know, who did not, you know, deny or, you know, confirm whether she was Jewish or not. He basically stated his, you know, opinion about like, what the frick are you talking about? Because no matter what you are, whether you're Jewish, Catholic, Christian, you know, whether you're black, white, yellow, you know, stand upside your head or identify as a unicorn, you're still a human being. So I'm forever proud of my grandfather for saying that, to be honest. So my grandmother one day was sent to do a uh, run an errand for her mom. So they they knew their neighbors, you know, way back then there was a lot more community going on, obviously, than there is nowadays. And there was uh, a lady in her neighborhood that I think was ill. And there was like this soup house that you could go to, like a place where you could just go and get like a either a bowl or a small pot of soup. And, um, you know, because food was kind of starting to run out. And I don't know what kind of service it was, but I know that she called it the soup house. And her mother sent her there to go and take this soup to the lady in the neighborhood that needed it. So my grandmother went out and did that. She went over to this little house or this place, whatever the building was, I don't know, and got herself the soup and went off to the neighbor. Now, as she hadn't left five minutes and a bomb fell on that particular building. And it's so interesting because now when I look back, I can't even fathom being alive, just coming out of like a soup house. You're doing something for another human being, right? Random act of kindness, really. And she hadn't left five minutes and the whole place was gone, obliterated. Like she could have died. And unfortunately, you know, some lives were lost and she was just out of there at the right time. And I'm forever grateful for that. But it kind of goes to show that, you know, it, it, it wasn't safe. You weren't safe. And anything could happen at any given time. And this was just during the day, broad daylight. This happened from what I remember. And another story here with my grandmother, and we're still talking about the same one from my mom's side of the family. As people were still, you know, allowed to get out of their houses and do things, she was out with a friend of hers. And you got to understand a little bit about my grandmother's personality. She was not one that would put her opinion somewhere on the back burner, not wanting to ruffle feathers. Like, if she felt injustice was done, she would speak up. And sometimes not just speak up, she would act on it. There are many stories of her as a child getting into trouble. She wouldn't agree with something because it went straight against her values um, or somebody just mistreated her. And yeah, it was better not to do that. Let's, let's put it that way. Now let's get back to when she's a teenager <laughs> and she was out with her friend walking about the neighborhood and they ran into some German soldiers and the one German soldier, I'm not sure whether he was drunk or whether he just was just a certain type of guy or in a mood. I don't know what his deal was. But he went up to my grandmother and I think started the conversation. But as far as I know, it wasn't much of a conversation. He decided that he was just going to stick his hands into her pants. Well, he picked the wrong woman to mess with. As soon as he did that, my grandmother knocked him out. She smacked him in the face, knocked him unconscious. He went down. The soldier wasn't on his own. He had a bunch of his friends or people around him or other comrades or whatnot. And one of the guys went up to my grandmother and said, you better run because he will wake up and I cannot guarantee what he's gonna do. So my grandmother and her friend just made it out of there, went back home and that is the end of that story. But I love that story because I'm like the wrong person to mess with. My, like I said, my grandmother was not one to back down. If she felt she was being violated, yeah, she would answer that with violence. And I'm actually really, really proud of her for doing that because yeah, obviously it's sexual assault, but what are you gonna do at a time of war when the Germans have taken over your country? I mean, I guess your police is nowhere to be found, right? So yeah, she knocked him out. 
totally knocked him out cold. And, but here's the thing. What is so neat about that story is too, that my grandmother always said to me, you know what? Not all the Germans wanted to be in the war. Not all German soldiers were terrible. Not all of them were bad. Some of them just were there because they had no choice. And she was very lucky that, you know, these other guys did not decide to, you know, act upon what my grandmother did, right? They basically told my grandmother and her friend, get the hell out of there, which they did. But till like years after, every time my grandmother told this story, she always said, not all Germans are bad. Not all the soldiers that were in the Netherlands wanted to be there. They had no choice. Those words, and you know, the action of the German soldiers basically telling my grandmother to get out of there and not doing anything have helped me over the years to come to peace with what the Germans had done, not just to the Dutch people, but to all the people that, you know, all the countries that they oppressed and all the people that they took prisoner and all the people that they killed basically. Because growing up in a country, you know, like next to the country, because we're neighbors, that did all these atrocities, kind of left a very sour taste in my mouth. And even though they do try to teach you that in schools, like, you know, we don't hate the Germans. As a child growing up and as a teenager, it's kind of hard not to have hard feelings towards that. And then especially hearing stories from your grandparents. Now, these are just a few from my grandmother, but I've got a another story coming from my grandfather and that one makes me just really mad and angry at the Germans and it took me a long time to kind of get over the fact that not all of these Germans wanted to fight in the war most of them were good guys and in fact um, there's many stories of Dutch women marrying German soldiers soldiers after the war so they're just people most people don't want to go to war. Most people don't want to harm other people, right? But that's one thing that from that story that till this day kind of helps me understand that not all people are bad and especially not all people from one particular country because heck, I don't want to be racist. But, you know, if you hear stories and if you see pictures of what, what happened to the people in the camps and things like that and, you know, go to the Anne Frank house and, and really immerse yourself in her story. Yeah, it, it's going to leave a little bit of a sour taste towards the Nazis and Germany and the Germans. And like, I mean, as like a huge disclaimer, I do not hate the Germans. Okay, I do not hate Germany. I've visited the country, right? And no hard feelings. Yeah, I do remember just my grandmother talking about them, you know, in a way that was still honoring the Germans, even though she had been violated badly by one even though she, you know, watched the, the fights in the air from her window and she could see the devastation that was being done to the city, even though she almost, she nearly died because of a bomb that dropped at the building that she went to. Like, just too many things that could make one very bitter and she, she chose not to. So I, I really, really, really respect that. I really do. Now on to my grandfather, so her boyfriend at the time. Now I am not 100% sure how he ended up in one of the work camps, but he did. I have no idea. And just a little side note on that. I, I do wish that I had asked more questions when they were telling these stories or that I would have just looked things up or whatever I could have done to get a little bit more information and a little bit more details. But it, it isn't until you're like older that you really start to realize, oh, wait a minute, I remember this story. Oh my gosh, that must have been incredibly hard from, you know, whatever person that happened to. And then not being able to actually go and ask them because sadly they've all passed away by now. So yeah, I just, I wish I was a little bit more inquisitive in that sense, but I wasn't so. But anyway, go back to my grandfather. He ended up in one of the war camps in Germany. Now, obviously there were different camps. There were work camps. They were, there were in between kind of camps where people would go and then from there, there they would be um, shipped to other places. And obviously then there were the few death camps um, that most people are aware of. Um, but he was not in one of those. He was in a work camp. I do not know where in Germany, somewhere. Now, my grandfather 
was just like your ordinary lad. He didn't really have any relationships with like certain people or he didn't have like information about anything. He was just an ordinary dude. But unfortunately, the Germans in that camp were under the impression that my grandfather had information that was important. You know, there was this whole people like, you know, the resistance kind of idea, right? Like, and that definitely happened. There were many, many, many organizations in the Netherlands that were operating underground, you know, trying to, you know, to get information out and back and forth. Like a lot of people put their lives on the line for information to go back and forth, like certain newspapers that were being printed that were so illegal that if any of the Germans would get a hold of it, like that will be the end of you. And um, I mean, maybe they thought he was in one of those organizations. My grandfather was not associated with anything or anyone, but they thought he did. And for that, he got beaten severely on a daily basis in one of those camps. And I don't know how for how long that went on, and I don't know how severe it was. I have no idea what the sort of torture um, he went through. I don't know if it was just being beaten. I don't know if, if they actually used torture devices or tortured him in, in different ways. All I know is that he was not treated well, to say the least. And eventually the war ended. And I'm pretty sure that's from what I've heard, he was in one of those camps. And then all of a sudden they were let go because the war ended. Well, what, what, what were you to do? They just basically opened the door, let all the you know prisoners out. Now, then, then what? So my grandfather walked all the way from where he was in Germany back to the Netherlands. And well, he lived near Rotterdam. So if he was in Germany, he would have to cross a very good part of, you know, first of Germany and then, you know, a good width of the Netherlands because Rotterdam is way on the other side. And he walked all the way and he was at the mercy of strangers he knocked on people's doors that would give him like a place to stay for the night and feed him and then he would go on the next day and the next day again the same thing and by the time he returned back to the Netherlands and by the time my grandmother saw him again he was nothing but bones there was not much left on him as far as muscle or fat was concerned like I do not know to this day how long it took him to walk but that's a long way. And he made it back. Thank goodness he did. But he wasn't left unscarred from that. Obviously, you can have physical scars from whatever people decide to do to you. But the emotional scars, they ran really deep. My grandfather, up until the day he died, had reoccurring nightmares. Now, way back then, you don't go see a shrink. You don't go see a counselor or a therapist. Like that is not something that was really something that first off men would do. And it just wasn't really part of society as much as it is now. Like mental health wasn't promoted, I guess, and, and supported as much as it is in today's day and age. And then, yeah, he just, he suffered from massive PTSD basically. And um, my grandmother would tell me, it's like, yeah, I would wake up sometimes in the night and he'd be thrashing around in his bed and doing all kinds of things while he was sleeping because he was having reoccurring nightmares because of the trauma that he went through in the camps. And that's basically what I meant with being mad at the Germans because they did that to my grandfather who had absolutely no information that was necessary for anybody. And the poor man suffered the rest of his life just because they believed he, they needed to beat him up. It's very sad. And to give this story a little bit more of a twist. So when my grandfather was in his 60s, he started to have some heart issues and he was uh, fitted with a pacemaker. And um, he had been home for a while. I think it had been like a couple of weeks or a couple of months that he had the pacemaker. And um, one night my grandmother woke up and he was moving about and making weird noises and stuff like that. And she just, you know, you're kind of in a slumbery state, right? When you wake up in the middle of the night and she thought he was having another nightmare, but in fact, he was having a heart attack and he passed away. I was six years old at the time and she has never really forgiven herself for that. She felt that if she would have acted, that she might have been able to do some CPR or whatever, you know, measures that she could think of and do by herself until help arrived. But yeah, it's, um, it's sad. He passed away at a young age and um, 
I wish that my grandfather would have sought help for his PTSD, but like I said, back then, it was more of a taboo and not really talked about, so yeah, it is what it is, I guess. Now, if I go to my dad's side of the family, I don't really have a whole lot of stories, just a little bit here and there. Uh, my grandmother, she was working during the war, the war of time, and I'm not quite sure as what and for who. And unfortunately, I cannot ask her because she has also passed away. So, But the thing was, she was done with her work and was returning home, and she had not been home for a long time. And she returned home, and... Um, her sisters were all excited that she was back. And the cool thing is that where they lived, the backyard of their place uh, bordered onto like a big field. Now, if you've ever been to the Netherlands, it is as flat as a pancake. We don't really have hills. The few we have, we are mightily proud of. But um, yeah, so she, <laughs> but there's a lot of fields out there, whether it's for growing potatoes, um, for growing grass, for, for cows or sheep. Lots of fields and obviously tulips, but I think that where she lived, it was more uh, like a field for animals. And usually these fields are really long and they're um, separated by little ditches on each side. And as I said, the Netherlands is very flat and unless there's a couple of trees or whatever, you can look for stinking miles, right? So that's what their house was kind of backing onto. And um, as she had come home, that also happened to be what we refer to in the Netherlands as D-Day. A lot of people think of D-Day, you know, when the, the soldiers kind of went on shore at the beaches of Normandy, you know, like along the coasts of Belgium and France. But for us, D-Day is people jumping out of airplanes, you know, parachuting down. And basically, that was the beginning of the liberation of the Netherlands. They just came out of the sky because... The Netherlands only has, like, part of it is a shoreline, right? There's a whole lot of other, like, more, like, inland part of the country. So, anyway, what happened was she was at, so she had come home that day, and it was happened to be D-Day, which obviously they didn't know. Like, that was unannounced. Like, who's going to tell everybody beforehand, oh, this is the day we're going to drop a bunch of people from airplanes so they can parachute down, right? She had no idea. So that happened right in that field. So for the more inland type, you know, part of the Netherlands, they had tons of people jumping out of airplanes and parachuting down. Well, she had like front row seat to that. She just saw all these soldiers coming down and that was the beginning of the liber liberation of the Netherlands. And um, when I think about that, I'm just like, wow, you know, you watched such a historic moment in like unfold right in front of you from basically the comfort of your own home and i would have loved to have gone to that place like because they didn't she didn't live there for the rest of her life like while i knew her she didn't live in that particular town um it would have been nice to actually have gone there one day and let her tell the story while she was standing you know where she grew up and unfortunately i didn't have a chance to to do that but yeah, and then as of recent, uh, my brother said that he heard a story that when she was on a train on the way back from wherever she was, that um, the train that she was on all of a sudden became under fire and that the Germans were shooting at it. So that's one other thing. But the thing is, unfortunately, I don't really have a lot of stories from that side of the family because she never really talked about it. My grandmother was a woman that... Uh, on my dad's side of the family don't please do not mix up this grandmother with the first one that I talked about but she was a, a woman that just loved life she just saw like you know the happy and positive things about stuff she was very down to earth but she could intensely enjoy the little things and I don't think she wanted to really think about that I mean what's the use of that is usually that's a lot of times I would hear her say well that's a waste of time or what's the use of that like let's enjoy now right those are a few stories from her end my grandfather who she married um he never said a word about the war my grandfather wasn't a man of many words anyway he was usually joking around with us uh, grandkids but he wasn't really a man that uh 
that talked a lot or told us stories. But there is something about my grandfather and his family that actually ties the Netherlands and Canada within my family, which is kind of funny when you think about it. So he's got a couple of siblings and one of his siblings, his sister, happened to fall in love with a Canadian soldier, you know. Um, for those who do not know, the Netherlands was liberated by uh, the Allies, which were um, the British, the Canadians and the Americans. So there have been quite a lot of, you know, war brides from that. And his sister was one of them. So she married a Canadian soldier and ended up moving to Canada. And um, now here's a little side story about how they kind of sort of stayed in touch. Because back then, you're not just going to, you know, call internationally. That just, nobody did that. It cost way too much money. And um, so what they did every Sunday, they would uh, basically ring the phone once, which was a little hello, which was really cute. And I, rem I remember even being at their house when that would happen. At times I would have like sleepovers or I would stay with them or whatever as a child and as a teenager and every Sunday around six o'clock the phone would ring but only once and my grandfather oh that's my sister and he you know waited like 10 seconds then he would pick up the phone dial her number let it ring once and then hang up and they did that for years and that was their way of saying hi to each other like once a week I think that is really really cool these are a couple of stories that I have known uh, and that I've grown up with that really made World War II so much more tangible. Um, I noticed having moved to Canada and then talking about World War II, a lot of people have no idea because Canada wasn't all that involved. Obviously they were like allies and eventually Canada has played a huge role in liberating the Netherlands, but not just that. Most people think of World War II, they think about the beaches of Normandy, they think about France, maybe Belgium because of the poppy story, right? Like the, in Flanders fields. There's not a whole lot of connection between Canadians and World War II unless, you know, you've had family members that have had gone to war and had been to those places, you know, to Europe. So when I tell some of these stories, I know that a lot of people are like, oh my goodness, right? And yeah, for the most, most of the Dutch people, the World War II still lives very much among us through the stories of our grandparents. And I just wanted to tell some of these stories so that it will not ever be forgotten. And they might have not seen massive atrocities and they may have, I don't know. They might've tried to protect me from that or my you know, other siblings or whatever by not telling certain stories but the war left a huge scar for the Netherlands and not only in certain cities but just emotionally and I remember as an adult going to the Anne Frank Museum because I'd never gone there for as long as I lived in the Netherlands I'd never been there until I, I immigrated to Canada in 2005 on one of the visits back I decided to go to the Anne Frank Museum and I'm glad I did it's uh it was it was really yeah, incredible, left a huge impression for sure because she was only just a girl, you know, and I'm thinking she was just about a couple of years younger than my grandmother was. It's kind of insane when you think about it, you know. They were only a few towns or cities apart at the same time. So, yeah, it's a small world kind of in a way. So I kind of want to move on a little bit into the deep connection I have with Remembrance Day and World War II. Right, and because World War II was so ingrained into the Dutch schooling system, uh, well, at least back when I was a child, it, it was, um, it always intrigued me and obviously was kept alive through these stories that I just, you know, mentioned. And it started to become full circle for me, funny enough, after I had actually left the Netherlands and had immigrated to Canada. I didn't know about Remembrance Day at all when I came here. You know, I learned about that real quick because I started seeing people wearing poppies and I was just like, huh, what is that? And learned about the history and stuff and that it had more, it tied more into World War I than World War II. But for me, World War II was so, you know, alive inside of me, right? That I kind of, you know, combined the two together. So every year, you know, we would go to some sort of memorial type service or what have you, or watch the parade and pay tribute and wear the poppy. And one of these 
times on a Remembrance Day, um, one of my kids was part of uh, the Navy League cadets. Uh, kids could be part of Navy League, Army and Air Cadets. And so my boy was part of um, Navy League. And so that was a mandatory thing that they had to participate in Remembrance Day, and which is not a bad thing because it's really good to teach children you know, about war and about veterans and that we can be very grateful for the freedom that we have today and that most of us have grown up without knowing war firsthand. And um, so they go in, like this was in a big hockey arena, hundreds of people gathered and all kinds of different organizations there. You'll be all kinds of different people there. Um, RCMP, for those who don't know, that's the Canadian police. Um, there will be a representation of the firefighters. There will be the cadets will be there. Uh, sometimes the Boys and Girls Club, like different places, people from the Legion, uh, war veterans themselves. Like it's a big deal. It is a really big deal. And um, it's a whole program. I think the whole thing t takes about an hour, if not longer. And um, so my, my son got to do their a little marching thing with with the group of cadets and they would just stand there there were the the war veterans as well and this is where i'm going to get emotional <laughs> because i here i am sitting in you know the audience because i'm there with my son and with my the rest of my family and um Usually, you know, somebody will sing the, the Canadian anthem and somebody will read the poem in Flanders Fields. Um, and then there's some veterans who will speak as well. And um, there was this one gentleman, one veteran, who went up to the microphone and started talking. And I'm sorry. For as long as I've been here in Canada and you know, been to different places. I had never hear someone speak about that they had been stationed in the Netherlands. It was always either France or Belgium. But this particular veteran said, started telling his story. And it became apparent real quick that he had been in the Netherlands, stationed in a certain town. And when he mentioned it, I'm like, oh yeah, that sounds familiar, <laughs> you know? And here I am sitting in the audience and all of a sudden it dawned on me. I'm first off, I'm not on Dutch soil. I'm on Canadian soil. I'm not even in my home country. And here is a Canadian veteran who decided to go to war, who decided to, you know, join forces with the allies and went to my country and helped liberate it. And I just broke down and cried. And of course I'm in a group of a hundred, a couple of hundred people, if not a thousand people. I don't know how big that arena was, but here I am sitting there. And I just realized that because of his choice, because of his bravery and, uh, and, and that of his comrades, my country was liberated because of him. I could live in freedom and not just because of that one person, obviously, but he just represented, you know, the freedom of my country. He represented, you know, my grandparents living through it and being alive and going on and having families of their own so that eventually along the line, I was born, right? I just wanted to jump up and run down the bleachers <laughs> And give this man a hug. Obviously, I didn't do that. But everything inside of me just wanted to scream. Thank you. And even today, as you can tell, I get teary-eyed. I get emotional. Because we cannot just take our freedom for granted. And uh, to this day, I have not ever met this man. I don't know where he lives, uh, obviously in my region. And I don't even know if he's still alive because this was a couple of years ago. But it just, everything just became full circle for me. And I was just deeply humbled. And I'm extremely grateful for those that have gone to war, that left their, oh, their home country, that went overseas to liberate a country that is so small. <laughs> the Netherlands is not big. 
you know, and for that I'm forever grateful because the Netherlands is still there, <laughs> obviously, and generations have come and gone and will continue to come and go. And I, n knowing that the generation, that the veteran generation is dying, a lot of these people have already passed on or are now in their 90s. There, there aren't many left that are still alive. And that's why Remembrance Day is so important to me. That's why I proudly wear a poppy. Every year I get emotional and every time I think about this particular story that I just told you and how personal it became for me. That's one of the reasons I decided I'm gonna have to do something uh, with my art and with my ability to paint. And that's where this painting came into being. In Flanders Fields. In Flanders fields, the poppies blow between the crosses, row on row, that mark our place. And in the sky, the larks still bravely singing, fly, scars heard amid the guns below. We are the dead. Short days ago, we lived, felt dawn, saw sunset glow, loved and were loved, and now we lie in Flanders fields. Take up our quarrel with the foe. To you from failing hands we throw. The torch be yours to hold it high. If you break faith with us who die, we shall not sleep though poppies grow in Flanders fields. Lest we forget. <laughs>